Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Alumni Experts. My name is Stephanie Sepiel Mill, and I serve as the Assistant Director of Alumni Communications here at Valparaiso University. We are thrilled to welcome you to another Alumni Experts virtual event sponsored by the Office of Alumni Engagement. This evening, I'm joined by Jared Geyer, class of 1999, lead forecaster at the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. Jared's duties at the SPC include issuing severe thunderstorm and tornado watches and warnings, as well as convective outlooks and mesoscale discussions. If you don't know what that stuff is, he's going to explain it shortly. <laughs> he is the author of numerous publications, including Tornadoes Within Weak Cape Environments Across the Continental United States, Cool Season Significant Tornadoes in the Gulf Coast States, and On Issues of Tornado Damage Assessment and F-Scale Assignment in Agricultural Areas. He, want, he said, I don't know if people want to hear about my papers, but I think you do. I think they all sound fascinating. <laughs> and they're available on the National Weather Service website as well. He is also actively engaged in outreach for the SPC. As a Valpo student, Jared was director of the Valparaiso University Storm Intercept Team, VUZIT, president of the Northwest Indiana chapter of the National Weather Association, and even served on the city of Valparaiso's early warning system committee for the implementation of emergency warning sirens. Jared, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Participants, please feel free to use the chat function on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom there to ask questions of our guest. We'll get to those as well as the pre-submitted questions after his presentation. This program is also being recorded, so you'll be able to watch a full replay of our discussion on the Velpo Alumni YouTube channel and share it with friends and family who may not have been able to join us this evening. I know that Jared is going to start with a little bit of background before he gets into the nitty gritty of the December event, but just to kind of introduce our topic, I'll start off with the first question. On December 11th and 12th of 2021, an atmosphere perfectly poised for severe weather verified its forecast, spawning 71 confirmed tornadoes in Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Indiana, and most notably, the violent tornadoes in Southern Illinois and Western Kentucky that made these two days the deadliest for a December outbreak in US history. What made this severe weather event so unique? Well, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for the invite, the uh, wonderful introduction, and the uh, very uh, appropriate setup there in the, in the uh, uh, question uh, regarding uh, the prolific severe weather that we saw this past December. Uh, as you mentioned, I'll start off with a background, and let me get that going here. Hopefully. All right. Hopefully, uh, my full screen is there, my introductory slide. So yeah, the meat of my presentation will be about the prolific severe weather, uh, really and trying to put a historical context to it, just how active it was, uh, particularly related to a couple of events this past December. But first, a little bit of background. Uh, I grew up in Southeast Illinois, a little town no one's ever heard of, Hudsonville, Illinois. It's right close to the Indiana-Illinois border. Uh, the closest town of, of, of size, uh, if you will, is uh, Terre Haute, Indiana, just about a 45 minute drive from it. Uh, uh, the town's located uh, where I grew up is about an hour and a half or so south of Ch uh, Champaign, Illinois. Obviously, University of Illinois there, a lot of, a lot of people uh, know that as a reference. Um, and uh, so I graduated, I'm an old guy, I graduated from Valpo in 1999. I actually did a dual, uh, dual majors while I was at Valpo, that includes uh, meteorology and communications with a broadcasting uh, emphasis. And um, some of the uh, wonderful opportunities, uh, the things that make Valpo great, uh, it's not just the academic coursework, but the experiences and the class sizes, uh, most of them modest size and the interactions with the, the, the uh, professors. Uh, it, you know, it's just a, a wonderful environment. And, and I definitely tried to take um, take advantage of that in terms of my learning experiences. So I was president of a local NWA chapter, director of VUZIT, Valpo Storm Intercept team, and uh, also worked for WVUR as a program director as we transition uh, into the into uh, the new digs at, uh, let's see, at Schnabel, I believe it was, and uh, also a DJ, intern for Tom Skilling at WGN-TV, and um, 
That was also when Valparaiso was starting to implement, uh, look, looking to implement uh, its uh, early warning uh, system sirens. And that was a great opportunity to uh, uh, just kind of be immersed in, in practical sort of downstream applications of, of weather uh, forecast and, and warnings and that type of thing. Uh, I was very fortunate right after graduation to start working for the National Weather Service. Uh, the previous summer before graduation, I'd interned at the Indianapolis, uh, Indiana National Weather Service office. Uh, but once I get, got in full time, spent a year and a half at La Crosse, Wisconsin, three years in the Central Plains, Hastings, Hastings uh, Nebraska. Uh, it was great to witness some uh, tremendous storms, uh, severe weather, tornadoes, and even uh, a couple of the worst blizzards I've been through were in that short uh, three year span. And, and now time flies, as I say, and I, I've spent a little over 18 years now at the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, uh, Oklahoma. Uh, basically, I'm very blessed to be living the dream, uh, working at uh, the Storm Prediction Center. I'll probably call it SPC here on out. Uh, was uh, basically a dream come true for me. So uh, uh, living the dream in, in, in that respect. And uh, I get the uh, pleasure, the opportunity um, to uh, try and forecast, do our best to give people a heads up about severe weather. Certainly wish that, uh, you know, it didn't happen, that type of thing, but that's not the reality of it. And so we do our best to, to give folks uh, a uh, heads up and uh, about uh, possible severe weather. And so uh, I've been doing that for almost two decades now. It's also a board member and treasurer for the, if you will, the National, National Weather Association. I uh, recently uh, finished my term uh, in terms of, of that and also am an AMS, AMS member uh, on the uh, AMS Severe Local Storms Committee. Obviously uh, wonderful, you know, especially for the meteorology folks out there, I certainly encourage you to, to uh, you know, have membership, participate in, take advantage of the opportunities of not only the, the national NWA local chapters as well, but national NWA as well as AMS. Certainly encourage you in those realms. A uh, quick blast <laughs> from the past here. This is me in the uh, center here. This is from our storm chase trip in 1998. So a little bit of old school Vuzit uh, there, the uh, storm chase team. And uh, this was our, uh, our digs, which aren't nearly as nice as what you folks have <laughs> now. So we've come a long way in the past couple of decades. And it's awesome that, uh, the, you know, the wonderful uh, facilities that you guys do have, uh, you know, when I've been there to visit and see things. A little bit, I uh, just wanted to touch on about the National Weather Service since uh, that's basically what I'm part of and it's my uh, career experience. Uh, just fundamentally, uh, especially for the folks that aren't meteorologists out there who aren't maybe uh, you know as well versed in some of these details, just wanted to share that we're part of the, the United States government. Um, the National Weather Service is a part of NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The National Weather Service has more than 4,000 employees and there are 120 plus offices nationwide. And uh, most folks may not necessarily get the information directly from us, but we provide the information to media. It's traditional media, including TV, radio stations, but also uh, increasingly so social media, that type of thing, uh, apps, uh, our forecast and, and warning services also um, are utilized by local government, emergency managers, and, and even the, the general public to, to uh, at least some extent. Uh, but we provide basic forecast out through the seven, uh, seven days. Uh, and uh, arguably more important, we provide watches and warnings, basically as heads up for, for uh, high impact storms. And so the mission statement is there to, to issue warnings, watches and forecasts, especially for the protection of life and property. Well, I'd love to have you guys all visit Norman, Oklahoma. I can't uh, take you all there uh, uh, necessarily uh, at the moment, uh, but we'll do our best to kind of show you a little peek uh, at uh, uh, where uh, we come from in terms of uh, the um, uh, National Weather Center, Center in Norman, Oklahoma, where uh, the uh, Storm Prediction Center is based. There's a, a look at the front of the building. Here's a snapshot at our operations area. There's me over in the corner. And another little close-in look at uh, our workstations. Basically, uh, as you might notice, uh, we have a number of uh, computers, workstations around us that gives us the ability to fluidly monitor weather, uh, not only in local areas, not only 
focusing on Indiana or where I am in Oklahoma, but we actually have to do that on a nationwide basis in terms of monitoring and forecasting uh, severe storms. So we're uh, looking at things like, like lightning here in this upper part, uh, in this upper left uh, image. Here front and center is a um, PC that's devoted to all kind of warning, uh, any kind of warnings that are issued, storm reports, that types of thing that's coming in from again, the entire uh, US, uh, we have that at our fingertips. And then in the multiple workstations, uh, there may be some cases where uh, someone is focused on severe weather, say in the Midwest, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, what have you. Uh, but then they're also having to keep an eye on other storms in, in other parts of the country. Maybe it's a Southeast event on the more active uh, time of the year, that type of thing. So just kind of look at our, our uh, environment there. And the way things work in, in terms of these heads up predictions as far as severe storms go, some of the terminology I want to introduce you to that uh, if you've not uh, uh, really seen it before or, or if you're not a meteorologist, what have you. So kind of starting on the left there, we'll kind of go left to right in general and we're about a week out, we can start to get indications that severe weather uh, is possible. Uh, we certainly are not anywhere close to being able to say a specific severe storm or tornado or is going to hit any particular location. We can't even really do that in the real short term, to be honest. But we start to get regional indications that severe weather is possible in certain regions, you know, especially in the five, six, seven days ahead of time. And, it, and again, these are just kind of real general, broad regional indications that severe weather uh, may occur. But typically, uh, as we go kind of to the right, as we get in closer to time, we're able to start to refine things. So we can have a pretty good idea about the general magnitudes of the severe weather threat, generalities of you know how likely tornadoes are, that type of thing, and kind of start to nail it down into sub-regional areas, parts of states that are that look to be more vulnerable, that type of thing. Now, as we get over here into hours ahead of time and, and even minutes, hours ahead of time, we issue what we call watches. So we go from outlooks, which are kind of long views, longer look uh, from uh, vantage points, uh, a general heads up, if you will. And again, there's more uncertainty out here, but as you get closer to time, that's where we issue watches. Watches, we don't intend those as uh, necessarily at times to uh, immediately go to your shelter, your, your, uh, so to speak. That's just to give you a heads up. You don't necessarily need to stop your activities, that type of thing, but just a general awareness that severe weather could be occurring across uh, the general region over the next several hours. And we get into closer time spans, that's where warnings are issued. Those are the take action uh, uh, things that are issued. Those are, to, are um, intended to prompt response in terms of uh, people uh, seeking shelter, uh, moving to a place of safety and that type of thing. So that's kind of an overview uh, of the terminology that outlooks to watches to warnings. Kind of another uh, different meteorological way to look at it. When we're looking a week out or say five plus days out, we're looking especially at big picture scenarios. We're looking at large scale patterns. In a general sense, uh, even though it might seem strange looking at something that's that's basically covering much of the Northern hemisphere here, Basically, the patterns and indications and the large scale things that we see that, that cover uh, things beyond, uh, beyond the continental United States, uh, we can get heads up and uh, in some sense, things on a large scale eventually kind of translate down to lower scales as you get into uh, uh, shorter time frames, that, that sort of thing. So we're looking at general patterns initially that are more favorable for severe weather. As we get closer to time, uh, basically a day or two ahead of time, then we're starting to get look at a little more details, a little more confidence in how things uh, are likely to evolve. And then finally, we're getting, in, in, getting into individual storms. And uh, that's where we get into the warning time frame and uh, the individual severe storms that are impacting people, including tornadoes. Another recap, look at it. So going from left to right, that's the initial outlooks, those broad regional areas where severe weather is possible. And then we start to refine those where, where things are more likely. And then hours ahead of time, you get into those watch time frames, time frames, and then 
individual warnings uh, come, uh, you know, typically after the watch. And those, uh, those warnings typically run for 30 to 60 minutes, uh, typically. And again, those are the immediate action uh, sort of uh, indications that severe weather is imminent. As a real general statement, uh, severe weather, uh, numerous folks are impacted by severe weather uh, across the country each year. Roughly, give or take, there's, there's about 1,200 tornadoes that we see across the United States uh, each year. The vast majority of those are relatively short-lived. Uh, most of them are relatively minimal uh, damage, damage, but you know, relatively localized, that type of thing. But there's a, a disproportionate higher end of tornadoes that, that uh, uh, are much more devastating, longer lived, that type of thing, that uh, cause the largest amount of damage and uh, are threats to, to lives and property. Uh, usually nowadays, in today's dollars, we see uh, more than a billion dollars of damage each year. And uh, it can vary greatly, but uh, the average number, long-term average of tornado-related deaths is roughly about 80, but again, that can vary greatly from year to year. Uh, so these outlooks, again, we issue those as potential going out to about a week in advance as far as severe weather goes. And when I say severe weather, we are most focused on uh, those storms that are gonna produce large hail, damaging thunderstorms win winds, aside from tornadoes. Our outlooks um, is uh, everything is based on a radius of uh, a 25 mile radius. The reason for that is when you think about a tornado or severe weather, it's inherently local. It's very small scale. In a given lifetime, the, the chances of someone being impacted by a tornado, especially if you're talking a uh, more damaging type of tornado, longer lived, or even other severe weather, uh, the chances of someone experiencing that is relatively low. Uh, we have to kind of broaden things a bit to, to kind of put things into terms that, uh, that are a little more digestible, if you will. Uh, so when we talk about outlook probabilities, we're doing that within a 25 mile uh, radius. Uh, but even then the overall numbers, uh, that type of thing, the probabilities are relatively low. Kind of speaking to that here is, basically getting into the peak of severe weather season. This is a climatology of tornadoes on a given day. So this is a daily climatology. This is all things equal in early May, the chances of experiencing a tornado within 25 miles of the point. And uh, there's a rather low number there across central Oklahoma. So it's prime time severe weather season in central Oklahoma, but even yet there's still only about a 1.3 percent chance of experiencing a tornado on a given day in May uh, of uh, within 25 miles uh, of your point uh, of your uh, immediate vicinity. So just kind of recapping there, the odds of a tornado, uh, again, impacting a particular location are extremely low. And that's even when conditions are very uh, favorable uh, with a well above normal risk. Uh, but then again, there's obviously a disproportionately high and even sometimes life-changing impacts if a tornado does impact your, your residence and uh, work or community, uh, what have you. So I just mentioned as it's, it's a challenging uh, job. There are communication challenges, uh, risk assessment challenges when you're talking about something that's relatively rare, like severe weather is, if you're, especially if you're talking about a kind of a finite point to your house, to your, your work, what have you. But yet we know every year that, that many people are, are undoubtedly impacted by severe weather and tornadoes. So to kind of get that messaging and, and uh, uh, that type of thing is truly challenging because most of our heads up that we give to people, uh, the vast majority of people won't experience severe weather in a given, uh, say a given watch or even outlook area. Um, so getting into a little more details about uh, the, the events from uh, December, 2021, this is kind of a big picture look starting off at uh, December. This includes multiple events. This first one here is December 10th, th this cluster of tornadoes. These red tracks are the tornadoes observed across the Tennessee Valley and Ohio Valley on December 10th. And then not even a week later, uh, another very uh, prolific event across the upper Midwest, Nebraska, Iowa, parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin. And we'll touch on them in a little more detail. But the uh, bottom line is uh, by far, 
2021 sets the pace, break rec breaks records in terms of the level of activity for severe weather and tornadoes. And uh, those uh, couple of events that we're going to highlight uh, really um, are, are the, were the main contributors to that. And we're going to touch on a little bit of why maybe that was the case. Okay, I mentioned the, the outlooks and, and touch on a little bit of background about those. Here's what our severe weather looked like for uh, late morning, Friday, December 10th. So basically ahead of things, uh, the event would, would really peak in the evening, especially after dark, uh, after sunset. And uh, after sunset, uh, nighttime tornadoes are, are, uh, are well acknowledged to be uh, notoriously, um, they're, they're challenging for spotters to see. Uh, the, the communication, uh, you know, folks uh, being occupied with evening activities, going to sleep if it's later in the night, that type of thing are truly challenging. And uh, there does tend to be a disproportionate uh, uh, impact on, uh, on uh, uh, disproportionate number of fatalities that do occur in the nighttime hours for, for some of those very reasons. And uh, so the, here's the outlook. The highest threat area, uh, we call it a moderate risk. That's basically a level four out of five. And uh, uh, we thought the highest risk was somewhere from the Memphis area up towards Paducah to just south of St. Louis. Uh, and then kind of a secondary sort of peak area uh, that spanned from uh, the Little Rock area up into central Illinois, central Indiana. And just for general perspective, let me just say, these are relatively rare outlooks to even have in December. Uh, it's not unheard of to have severe weather, but yet to even see risk levels of this magnitude is kind of, is kind of a tension getting in itself. And uh, so there's that moderate risk. I also should point out that severe weather, even though we think this is a maximum area, it does not mean that severe weather is, is that much more likely in a relative sense here versus say the adjacent uh, areas. It's, it's, uh, um, you know, it is an estimate. Uh, forecasting is not a, a, a perfect uh, science by any means. For the, the meteorological junkies out there, there's just a look at the 500 millibar chart. Strong jet stream winds preceding a trough coming through the plains air. Winds over 100 knots uh, in the mid and upper levels uh, spreading out uh, across the Midwest, where we had a, a relatively rare, uh, relatively moist air mass, especially by December uh, standards. I mentioned the risk categories. Uh, there they are. Uh, in terms of general expectations for a moderate risk, we're in essence saying that widespread severe storms are likely. They could be long-lived, widespread, and intense. And certainly we saw that on December 10th, uh, no doubt. Uh, certainly those, those type of outlook thresholds tend to be associated with stronger uh, types of tornadoes, more numerous tornadoes, that type of thing. In terms of the tornado outlook, this is... Uh, a uh, hatched area we have here denoting that uh, strong tornadoes were, were possible, and we certainly saw that, uh, no doubt. We had a number of strong tornadoes. Let's see, I think it was 23, uh, I believe, at, at last count, uh, were uh, rated EF2 on the Enhanced Vegeta Scale, EF2 or greater. That includes a couple of violent tornadoes in the mix as well. And again, it was kind of focused on that Little Rock up to St. Louis area over to Nashville, and uh, so forth. Well, what happened? Uh, so this map here shows the outlook that you saw on the previous uh, screen, a little bit different colors, that type of thing. But these red uh, polygons, these are the actual tornado warnings that were issued. So, uh, and we'll look at things a little more de detail, radar wise, what have you. But all of these red polygons, uh, these were, were tornado warnings were issued uh, that evening. Uh, so especially note here from parts of Arkansas up into Tennessee and Kentucky. Also a somewhat separate area uh, to the north across Missouri into uh, Illinois that was particularly active. Even into Northwest Indiana, a couple of tornado warnings and a uh, uh, brief tornado as well up in uh, far Northwest uh, Indiana. So again, most of that was kind of centered in that peak uh, risk area that we had outlined by the uh, mid-late morning hours on December 10th. A couple of snapshots just showing the general evolution, how things began. This is about 4.45 p.m. Uh, Central Time. And the first tornado watch was issued 
uh, with a fair amount of lead time ahead of the uh, ahead of the severe weather that'd be unfolding across this region as the evening uh, wore on. Some of the initial development that would go on to be destructive as it to approach the Mississippi River and beyond was beginning here in the Little Rock area about 4.45 p.m. And this is the first tornado watch that was issued across the region. And let's go about an hour forward. And we've had another tornado watch issued that covers parts of Missouri and Illinois. We have a tornado warned storm here in Western Kentucky. And this activity continues to organize here northeast of Little Rock. And that would go on to be a prolific severe weather producer. Uh, so that's a snapshot of about 5.40 p.m. And let's go forward another hour and even more. Oh, I forgot. Here, I wanted to highlight uh, one of the uh, uh, discussions. We call these mesoscale discussions. This is just the graphical component of it. We also do have, there's a company text discussion. This is intended for, to go to other meteorologists, other emergency managers. It's a technical type of discussion, trying to give our thoughts, our expertise on how some of the details over the next hour or two of how we're expecting severe weather uh, to evolve. Our storm's expected to intensify. We give some of the meteorological reasoning. Are there preferred corridors for severe weather in a regional spatial sense? We try to uh, note that if we can. And so that's called, uh, those are called mesoscale, small scale uh, discussions. And here's one that was issued right around this time, highlighting that area from Northeast Arkansas into Kentucky and Tennessee that we thought was uh, particularly uh, primed. Uh, it's noted there that there was a locally higher threat uh, maybe evolving uh, in that corridor. Now we go forward to almost seven o'clock and things are even more active. And we've had to issue uh, watch number uh, three and four uh, across the region. And you can see multiple corridors of storms, not only in Arkansas, but back uh, even in Northeast Texas, across Missouri. And things are really getting active west of the St. Louis area. And along those lines, there is a, for the activity near the St. Louis area, that's another area that we were focusing on in terms of there being a higher uh, tornado threat that was materializing right around this time. Um, and uh, again, that's highlighted there in that, that mesoscale discussion, the, the graphical portion of it there. Well, I'll borrow from our friends at the uh, Weather Channel, they have a great loop here, just kind of shows a general perspective of the uh, storm that was beginning on, around Little Rock. And this is about starting at five o'clock central time. And we'll go forward and there are little pauses here. And this would turn out to be a prolific long track storm, a long track supercell that span seven, eight hours and, and beyond, dep depending on how you define it. I'll start it off again here. It goes from Little Rock, Northeast Arkansas. It's crossing into Missouri Boot Hill a little bit of Northwest Tennessee. There's the Mayfield, Kentucky area that was very hard hit and it continues onward. And you can see just this radar loop, it spans from uh, 5 p.m. all the way into the overnight hours uh, before the storms finally uh, merged and, and weakened into uh, Northern Kentucky. This uh, snapshot here is of the uh, that supercell uh, storm as I referred to it. And st uh, supercell storms have rotating updrafts these storms can kind of somewhat take a life on their own. Uh, supercells, why we're most concerned about them is they are our disproportionate severe weather producer, all things equal. Uh, they are associated with stronger types of tornadoes, such as we saw in this event. Uh, and they uh, can be very long lived. And this one really takes the cake in terms of uh, the longevity uh, of this supercell. So again, it started from uh, near the Little Rock, Arkansas area, tracked all the way to Louisville. Uh, it's, it's kind of been referred to as the quad state supercell because it, it moved through or moved across parts of four different state, continued uh, for at least eight hours and, and arguably 350, maybe even 400 miles and, and beyond. And uh, there's that uh, continued uh, progression of it. Again, most supercell storms don't last nearly this long, but uh, this was uh, in a pris pristine environment, strong jet stream level winds. Other ingredients certainly contribute to the longevity of it. This is a radar snapshot of the uh, supercell storm as it was impacting the Mayfield, Kentucky uh, area shortly after 9 p.m. Central Time. This is a radar reflectivity here in the upper left. This is basically the, uh, the hook, the uh, debris ball 
This is an indication, uh, won't go into a lot of detail, but indications of the debris uh, associated with uh, that this tornado was producing. There's the circulation, uh, and, and some of this is, is uh, impacted or related to the uh, tornado and the debris it's producing at the time. But um, uh, certainly a town of uh, uh, Mayfield, Kentucky is one of the most notable uh, places to be impacted uh, in terms of uh, uh, the impacts for, from this event. Here's an aerial view of, of Mayfield, Kentucky. I think it's a town about 10,000 or so and just widespread uh, devastation through, um, through much of the town. A couple of other uh, aerial shots. This is uh, some of the, the, the swirls related to the tornado. Uh, that was taken from an aerial vantage. And I um, uh, wanted to move on here to um, if uh, hopefully uh, folks uh, might have seen it. If you don't, uh, at least want to put a plug for a 60-minute uh, special they did sometime, uh, perhaps about a month ago, they did a uh, feature on the uh, December 10th tornadoes. And uh, uh, I thought I'd play a little video clip of that because I think it's important to, to kind of see some of the damage and just the real life impacts that tornadoes can do. Thankfully, most tornadoes aren't are quite this potent, potent this quite uh, long lived, but uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, just can be, you know, obviously very devastating, uh, especially as longer lived varieties, uh, more intense uh, tornadoes. So this particular video clip runs about uh, two minutes. It features a uh, damage expert uh, Tim Marshall, and certainly encourage you to go to the 60 Minutes website and check out the long form uh, story and piece that they did kind of uh, covering the whole event. Uh, I thought uh, they did a great job with it. These cars are really mangled up here. The building fell pretty much like a house of cards. That tells a story right there. This is an unusual thing. We don't normally see refrigerators and trees. They don't usually look that good. I mean, that actually looks quite intact. Here's a pier and beam foundation. It does not do well because they're not anchored. It's really a, a strap right here. It's unusual to see that here. You'd see them in Florida, but not so much here. This is the connection right here. So typically, how these plates are attached to the floor. Code's 90 miles an hour. So obviously this tornado had wind speeds greater than 90. She's in there. Now this is unusual. You don't normally see a board like this uh, branch go right through a tire like this. So a branch going through has to go at a pretty high velocity, you know, something over 100 miles an hour uh, to do that. And the way it punctured right on through it, it, uh, it kind of makes you think about this. If it can do this to a rubber tire, what can it do to human flesh? You gotta pick your blocks carefully. It's like Indiana Jones. And it just pulled it right out of the concrete because there's nothing to, to spray it out. A little head on the bolt, that's not enough bearing. It just pulls it right off. Yeah. All right, and I certainly encourage you to, to maybe seek that out if you're interested that uh, the 60 Minutes piece on the, uh, they talk with uh, some of my colleagues at the Paducah National Weather Service office, uh, some of the uh, issues and, and uh, um, challenges that they were facing and, and uh, that type of thing. And like I say, I thought they did a great uh, uh, piece on that uh, event and, and bringing it to, uh, good attention to it and helping folks there, that type of thing in that area. So uh, Kentucky and uh, surrounding areas are certainly a hard hit. Another one of, uh, another area of note was up toward the St. Louis area. There was an EF3 tornado near the Edwardsville, Illinois area. That's notable, uh, caught a lot of press because it uh, impacted uh, an Amazon facility. There's a radar snapshot as a tornado is coming close to the Edwardsville, uh, Illinois area. It was an EF3 rated tornado. Unfortunately, there were at least six fatalities at that Amazon 
facility. And here's a couple of snapshots of that Amazon uh, building and uh, the damage that it took on. I mentioned before and highlighted a few of these mesoscale discussions. Um, we really, uh, you know, really tried to pull out all the stops on, on this event and, and especially so, you know, given the magnitude of the event, uh, you know, as we saw it unfolding, that type of thing. We actually issued uh, some of the most of these mesoscale discussions, small scale discussions uh, that we've uh, ever done on a given shift. And uh, we are trying to provide updates every, uh, commonly every 30 minutes at least. Again, these aren't warnings or any uh, type of thing. They're trying to kind of bridge the gap uh, between watches that are out, tornado watches, and uh, individual warnings that are issued. Again, these are going out to media folks, emergency managers, kind of as uh, you know, inside baseball sort of meteorological details uh, information in terms of what we're seeing and what we're anticipating. Uh, um, as best we can, how things will, will evolve over the next hour or two uh, in a lot of these situations. Number of watches were issued, 11 tornado watches. There were tornado watches that span basically from Northeast Texas, Northern Louisiana, all the way north into much of uh, Illinois, uh, Indiana. Uh, so a total of 11 tornado watches on that day. And so in terms of the perspective in terms of December and just putting it into a context of just how active December was. There's uh, the, the total on the right. Uh, you can clearly see from the bars there just how active 2021 in terms of December was uh, with the number of tornadoes. There have been other years, past years, that have been relatively active uh, where uh, uh, numbers have, have approached around 100 or so in terms of uh, tornadoes in December, but uh, um, it just kind of speaks to just how uh, the truly active and record setting that last this past December was. And unfortunately, that, the, those, uh, that event on December 10th was disproportionately responsible <clears throat> for a number of tornadoes or fatalities uh, for the year. And uh, so there were 100, we ended the year with 101 tornado fatalities uh, compared to 2011. Uh, where uh, there were a number of notable, notable events, uh, Joplin, Missouri, uh, the so-called super outbreak of April 27th, 2011. Uh, that was a very active year. Um, but unfortunately, uh, 2021 ended, uh, uh, went out on a, on a poor note there, just given the, the uh, activity level and the uh, uh, loss of life and, and property that happened there just uh, at the end of the year. A little more climatological perspective, just how rare are strong tornadoes in mid-December? Well, we they do happen. And this uh, map here kind of speaks to the, the geographic areas, spatial areas where they do tend to occur. Um, and mostly they tend to be across the Gulf Coast states, but we can see tornadoes, severe weather up into parts of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, but on a relatively rare basis. To kind of compare that to the spring, that inset on the lower left is, is uh, early May again. And so you can see uh, the, the overall probabilities for December are much lower. So severe weather tornadoes do happen. They're just uh, a lot less common than what we typically see uh, during the spring. As possible influences and factors that went into the level of activity uh, above normal sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, existed through the end of 2021. That was likely uh, a factor uh, that relates to more energy, more moisture, and more energy being available uh, for systems as they're coming in. That downstream leads to, uh, can lead to severe weather uh, where temperatures and, and moisture is usually otherwise limited uh, this time of year. Uh, the, the topic of uh, climate change and, and uh, how that uh, potentially relates to events like this, uh, you know, that's those are talks in and of, uh, of itself. I guess I would say in general, uh, it's hard to, to relate any event to, to any type of larger scale climate type uh, uh, forcing that type of thing. But uh, there is work that, that suggests spatial trends, uh, eastward adjustments to uh, severe weather peaks may be occurring uh, toward and east of the Mississippi River. So increased activity is, is shown there kind of in the yellow orange areas where uh, also diminished activity across parts of the Southern Plains, Oklahoma, North Texas, and so forth. 
perhaps uh, we can a little bit more tie it to uh, uh, factors such as El Nino and La Nina. And uh, those are, are cyclically occurring every handful of years. We'll tend to see a fluctuation back and forth between El, El Nino and La Nina. Currently, we're in La Nina conditions, and they likely peaked around the same time as we had these severe weather events in December. And so when we have La Nina conditions, the blue purple colors are higher levels of activity. Tornadoes are on the top here in La Nina and, and uh, hail, hail storms, severe weather more general is, uh, is noted in this lower graphic. But we do tend to have higher levels of tornado activity, uh, what we call Mid-South, Mississippi River vicinity, Tennessee Valley. In contrast to El Nino, things are much quieter, much more subdued than normal in El Nino conditions, and things are more peaked across the southern tier. And uh, so perhaps that was another factor uh, in terms of going forward. Again, we likely peaked in our La Nina uh, type conditions in December going forward. The La Nina is expected to abate and trend to more neutral uh, type conditions. On the left is a uh, composite mean of the jet stream conditions and uh, uh, all, these, uh, all these conditions are interrelated uh, in terms of uh, oceanic, sea, uh, oceanic temperatures, uh, the fluctuations, and then uh, jet, stream, uh, jet stream strength, anomalies, that type of thing. And so in December 2021, we had a more amplified uh, pattern in place, what we call a ridge here over the Pacific, a little more amplified, stronger winds. Uh, stronger winds uh, in general for severe weather are, are favorable. All things equal, they tend to or can lead to longer, once you have storms established, longer duration storms, uh, more organized storms, that type of thing. Uh, that was probably some background influence for this event. Is that stronger jet stream land, uh, winds? And it was kind of a falls a typical sort of classic pattern for a wintertime La Nina uh, scenario where you have more uh, wetter, uh, stormier conditions uh, across the Tennessee Valley, parts of the Midwest, a little bit drier across the southern tier. And we see that even in, in uh, uh, our watch issuances, um, which obviously should go hand in hand kind of with the general level of severe weather activity. Uh, the blue green areas are where things are more active during La Nina conditions. It's very similar to the slides we've seen previously. These areas across the, the, the South Texas, Florida are typically more active uh, when El Nino uh, conditions are present and things are quieter uh, up here, uh, farther north uh, uh, in contrast to, to what I said for the La Nina area. We're also gonna quickly look at another event uh, from December 15th. So just five days later, yet another very prolific severe weather event uh, across the number, uh, across the uh, upper Midwest, spanning parts of uh, Kansas, Nebraska, up into uh, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Uh, widespread wind damage, uh, some of it very significant, very strong winds, and uh, uh, upwards of, of 90 plus tornadoes uh, uh, during this day as well. Uh, they weren't uh, quite the same intensity, high end nature. Uh, as compared to uh, December 10th, but very noteworthy itself. On the left-hand side here is a number of severe thunderstorm warnings and basically they're just wall-to-wall -wall warnings across a very broad region. You don't usually see this kind of density for warnings. The reds are the, uh, the red uh, polygons are the tornado warnings that were issued. There are 70 plus tornado warnings issued on this day. If that wasn't enough, on the back side of the system, there was uh, there were uh, very large wildfires. This basically here is the state of Kansas that we're looking at. And just think about the uh, the, these dark colors are where there were, there were uh, burns, uh, wildfires being noted here on satellite. And just think about how much, uh, you know, compared to the whole state of Kansas, that, that is uh, the large number of acreage where there's, where there's very devastating and fast moving uh, wildfires going on as well. Another kind of regional look at this event. This will start from about midday noon and go through the nighttime hours. Yellow are severe thunderstorm warnings, red are tornado warnings. You can see just the prolific activity, the, the blue dots in its wake are the, uh, the uh, wind gusts that were measured. I'll loop this one more time. So again, another about 12 hour duration event, very widespread, very impactful 
uh, across that region. And very rare for, for this time of De December, especially that far north. Kind of speaking to that rarity, this is what the uh, wind probabilities from a climatological perspective uh, from that expectation would be and uh, very, very low, rare, rarefied air. Uh, first tornado in December in uh, Minnesota, at least there may have been another uh, state uh, in that regard as well, but I know offhand uh, for Minnesota for sure. Just very uh, rare situation to have uh, that, uh, that uh, any severe weather in general really, but then that magnitude of event that far north. Uh, so uh, let's see, while I pause here, I have some, especially the folks that aren't uh, meteorologists, that type of thing, I have some severe preparedness sort of information ready, but uh, maybe I should pause here and check in with Stephanie and and uh, uh, see if you'd like me to proceed with this or, or uh, get into some questions. Yeah, we've got a couple of pre-submitted audience questions, but I haven't seen any other pop up. So if you just want to give us a quick overview of okay. that's preparedness, and then we'll, we'll get to those last few questions here as we approach the end of our time. Okay, very good. Well, I just wanted to, especially for the folks that are not meteorologists out there, and it is that time of year where, where we do need to be looking uh, forward to the, uh, you know, typically uh, more active springtime and early part of the summer, and just wanted to touch upon a few things. Uh, we common, very commonly get these sort of questions, and uh, so I figured I'd try to uh, beat folks uh, to it and, and go ahead and answer some of these questions. And um, unfortunately, I don't have very detailed answers for you. Basically, what will the spring look like? No one knows, <laughs> certainly in detail. I can tell you, I'm a forecaster, there will be tornadoes, I promise. There will be tornadoes. Uh, there will be tornadoes uh, in an increasing manner as we go, especially into March, April, uh, and May. And that threat will spread north like it always does into the Midwest, especially as you get into the uh, April timeframe, May and, and uh, alike. Uh, will this year be like last year? Well, you know, folks are always trying to uh, uh, get a handle on things in terms of regional uh, yearly sort of activity. But uh, truth be told, you know, severe weather is very localized. Uh, if it happens in your backyard, then that's a, you know, that's a high risk, so to speak. If, if you're impacted by a tornado, even if it's not the strongest variety, you know, that definitely um, makes for a bad day and bad week and bad, you know, beyond. So it only takes one tornado, even, even quieter years have very, uh, can have devastating events and so forth. Tornado safety, where is your shelter? Well, ideally, uh, if you have an underground shelter, a safe room or basement, those are the best options typically. Uh, if those aren't available, then the lowest floor of a sturdy building. And uh, the, the situations where we really don't want to find ourselves in are uh, being outdoors, unless you're storm chasing in a safe, responsible manner, or in uh, vehicles or mobile uh, manufactured homes. That's where uh, those type of things are where we won't want to have a plan or hopefully an alternative in terms of uh, where we can do, go in terms of refuge uh, uh, ahead of uh, a potential tornado threat. If you don't have a basement or shelter, where do you go? Well, bathroom there is not a good idea. There's uh, windows and uh, outer wall exposure. Same thing with uh, uh, bathroom there, or the bedrooms there in that part of the house. Probably in this situation, the ideal one would be this closed in utility room. There are no windows. Uh, it's away from uh, uh, wall, the outer walls of the house, that type of thing. Uh, that would probably be the best area to go. Uh, where's your shelter? Again, the idea is avoiding outside walls, doors, and windows. Uh, you do want to consider things like small interior closets. Uh, again, trying to avoid windows. Uh, things like interior bathrooms where there are no windows or no skylights. Uh, under the stairs might be a possibility if you have a two-story house. Uh, kitchen pantry, that's another thing uh, that you might consider uh, if you have one of those. Uh, you also need to be prepared uh, in terms of getting your area, thinking ahead where you're going to go, supplies, that type of thing. Um, <laughs> here in Oklahoma, we usually have to uh, vacuum out the uh, spiders and the like from our storm shelters every spring. Uh, you also don't want to have to go into a closet and have it filled up, right? you know, uh, have to move stuff in real short order. So just uh, kind of encouragement there to think ahead and at least have, uh, uh, you know, some sort of plan. A safety. Same thing goes with supplies. If you have pets, think about them, how you're going to handle 
uh, them. Obviously, uh, uh, things like water, flashlight, uh, radios, uh, medicine, uh, cell phone, you know, uh, uh, backup chargers if you have uh, that uh, at your disposal as well. Just uh, again, just kind of thinking ahead ahead of pretending potential severe weather. Uh, ideally, you want to have at least three ways to get a warning. That include that can include uh, regular traditional TV, no weather radio. Uh, sirens are are you know, mostly intended for outside in a supplemental sense, not intended to to necessarily uh, reach you inside, and certainly not intended to 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 wake you up. Obviously, cell phones, that type of thing. But again, uh, diversifying your portfolio, so to speak, having ways, multiple ways to get a, a warning. You have to account for the possibility of not having electricity or no internet service. Uh, cell service can go down at times, uh, especially in, in more prolific, severe storms. Uh, you may have to account for your TV going out. You may lose uh, cable or satellite may be blocked from a storm, what have you. You also have to account for being asleep or if you're away from home. Uh, so uh, just some some things to keep in mind there. And uh, with that, uh, let's see, I do know we have a question in terms of, uh, I'll, I'll just briefly uh, touch on, I know we had a question about the super outbreak and how yeah, it yeah. compares. So I'll just mention that quick. It was another very active event. Uh, it was, uh, you know, one of the most prolific in history. It's definitely up there in the handful of, uh, of events in uh, tornado history in terms of uh, the widespread nature and intensity. Uh, it's a very you know similar system to what we saw in general in terms of the uh, overall dynamics, so to speak, of the system. Now we are talking about April here, and this uh, event uh, produced around 150 tornadoes across uh, Tennessee Valley into the Midwest. One thing about being April is there was uh, much more moisture uh, in, in play, uh, much more than we would typically or could see in December, really. And that led to a probably arguably, a, you know, an even more extensive north-south uh, severe weather threat, uh, kind of bit of a comparison contrast to our December 10th event. So I thought I'd go ahead and touch upon that as well. And with that, I will pause and uh, bring back in Stephanie and let her uh, see where we want to go from here. Yeah, there was one more um audience submitted question from Noah. Um, and he asked about um, the unusually high fatality rates um, for this. You know, you, you showed that slide where we obviously know 2011 was an anomaly. That was a very, very active year. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, the United States had done pretty well at keeping fatalities low again until December, 2021. What, what kind of factors do you think went into to the increase? Yeah, great question. Um, honestly, there's probably more questions than our, than our answers, uh, it, it seems like at times. The nighttime nature of it was certainly uh, an artifact. Even if people weren't asleep, they're still kind of maybe in relax mode, that type of thing. There's maybe disbelief because it's December. Um, you know, admittedly, and I can't blame folks, you're, you're not, uh, you're, you know, people are probably more thinking about Christmas and the holidays upcoming and shopping and uh, par holiday parties and that type of thing. They're, they're probably not typically really in the mode of uh, severe weather. Even if they hear about it, you know, there can be understandable skepticism. It is what happened is relatively rare. And to expect, uh, you know, it's un understandable from a human nature sense to, to not necessarily expect that prolific uh, of an event. So I think the nighttime aspects of it, you know, nowadays, even uh, I think about technology and communications, a lot less people are, are partaking in traditional TV, you know, where you get interrupted or same thing with like uh, uh, terrestrial radio, that type of thing. A lot more people are, are, have cut the cord. You know, you may be watching Netflix or Amazon Prime where you don't have the TV meteorologist, uh, you know, uh, uh, butting in the programming and, and, uh, you know, learning you to things uh, going on. There's a whole lot of factors uh, that go into it. Some of it is just the unfortunate nature of where the storm tracks. Um, you know, if things were, were different uh, going through, you know, just a little bit north or a little bit south and in some of these towns, you know, Mayfield, Kentucky comes to mind, um, the outcome would have been different. Uh, it's just uh, a lot of factors go into it. It's really hard to to, to uh, boil it down, to, to be quite honest. But those are some of the things I think probably came into play. Yeah, 
Um, since I know we have some meteorologists and some future meteorologists uh, joining us this evening as well, I'll just ask you one closing question <laughs> related back to your, your career. So what advice do you have for current or prospective Valpo students who are exploring a career in forecasting, specifically with the National Weather Service? Well, uh, certainly, um, certainly encourage you uh, to, to give it your all. Uh, and uh, certainly, if, if that's what you go on, uh, go into, uh, certainly I'm happy to be a, a cheerleader for you and, and certainly uh, um, you know, admire anybody that wants to go into it. It's a great field. It's a very challenging field. There are some rough days. Uh, there are, uh, you can't, uh, can't have too big of a, a ego or, or think you have everything down because uh, the atmosphere has a way of humbling you and, uh, and um you know, uh, realizing that there are a lot of unsolved things in the science. Uh, it's, uh, I've heard it said, you know, from other professionals and other fields before, you kind of really get to be an expert when you realize how, just truly how difficult things are. I remember coming out of school and thinking, uh, okay, I know how to forecast, I know how to do this. And then, um, you know, the reality is sometimes a little bit different and, and experience, uh, you know, comes into play and in, in learning from, uh, learning some tough lessons uh, comes into play. But uh, certainly as far as educational approach, uh, you know, take advantage of, of everything you can uh, academically. Um, and then also uh, uh, surrounding that other, uh, you know, opportunities you have in terms of internships, uh, things like uh, aside from core meteorology classes, things that uh, deal in communication or relate to emergency management, computer programming, um, web programming, those type of things, those are all great assets as well. Uh, so certainly uh, get uh, immersed as much as you can. Again, take advantage of those student opportunities. Um, and even if you go into a different niche, just it's good to have an understanding of, of even what your fellow meteorologists are doing, uh, their approaches, what they're learning. Uh, because I, at me as an operational forecaster, I benefit from what say research forecasters or excuse me, research meteorologists are studying and vice versa. We need to have those, you know, interactions and communications and that type of thing. So just kind of an array of thoughts that come to mind there, but, but certainly I encourage folks to, to uh, no doubt pursue their dreams. Yeah, well, that's great. Thank you so, so much again, Jared, for joining us. We have really appreciated your expertise. Um, if someone would like to get in touch with you after the program, we've had kind of a shy audience with, I bet you there are more questions out there. How can they do so? Yeah, uh, well, let me, uh, let me share my screen here again. It's, uh, let's see, sorry, kind of walking and chewing gum here. Let me share it again. <laughs> I'll uh, uh, hopefully it's all earlier, but I'll show my uh, my uh, contact information here, and uh, certainly welcome to get a hold of me. There's uh, my Twitter uh, Twitter contact information and my uh, uh, email address, and so certainly folks uh, can feel free to uh, reach out and uh, touch base. And I kind of scanning around here, see wonderful, see some uh, names I know and that type of thing. And just uh, again, I uh, want to say thanks and appreciate everyone for tuning in. Yeah, and I'll say the same. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. Uh, we have some other exciting virtual and in-person events coming up, including our next installment of Alumni Experts on March 16th, featuring photojournalist Sean Elliott, class of 2000. I hope to see many of you in St. Louis for brunch with President Padilla and some Arch Madness men's basketball action as well. And that brunch is on March 5th. And you can register for those events and more at alumni.velpo.edu slash events. You can also see replays and highlights of past virtual events on our Velpo Alumni YouTube channel youtube.com slash Valpo alumni. Thanks to all you folks that subscribed helped us claim that URL finally. <laughs> we hope you'll also follow us on social media to stay connected to exciting news and events. That's at Valpo alumni on Twitter and Instagram and Valparaiso University alumni on Facebook. Thank you all again. Thank you, Jared. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Stay well. <laughs>